At just after midnight on June the 2nd, 2017, 42-year-old Filipino Jesse Carlos entered the resort's World Casino Complex in downtown Manila. It was a place he had frequented many times before, but tonight he wasn't here to play the slot machines or roulette. Tonight, he was here to rob the place. His plan was simple. Go in, shoot the place up, cause as much confusion as possible, rob the chip room and then, in the middle of all the chaos, escape through the adjoining hotel. Admittedly, it doesn't sound like a great plan, but for a desperate gambler, a man deep in debt who had already lost his family, his property and his reputation, a man who had already killed two people earlier that evening, well, maybe he didn't really need a great plan. Maybe this was, in reality, his final gamble. One more spin of the wheel all or nothing in one last fatal stand. From family members we know that Jesse Javier Carlos grew up in the Tondo district of the Philippine capital Manila, a poor neighbourhood which sprawls along the banks of the Pasig River. Apparently Jesse wasn't top of his class in school but he was the kind of guy who was determined to do well. As a young man he did all kinds of odd jobs, driving a truck, he was a jeep taxi driver for a while, and he worked as a furniture restorer. But after passing the board entrance exam, Jesse managed to get a government job working in the Department of Finance, earning around 15,000 pesos per month. One close cousin remembers Jesse being proud of his successes, variously mentioning business interests in mining, fishing, and owning a farm which bred fighting cockerels. Jesse, now married with three children, seemed to be on the up and up. He'd bought a new house, the kids went to a private school, the family had a private driver, and a seemingly endless stream of new cars. Onya Medina, Jesse's cousin who still lives in Tondo, recalled that Jesse liked to make himself the star of his own story, but I can't deny I was jealous of my cousin, that he had made it, and that there was a big difference between his life and mine. However, behind the flash cars, chauffeurs and fancy birthday parties, Jesse's life was spiralling out of control. He had always liked to gamble, but the gambling was getting out of hand. Rumour was that Jesse had moved on from betting on just street games and cockfighting and was now betting big money at the downtown casinos. He was betting big and he was losing big. On top of this, Jesse had been dismissed from the Ministry of Finance and barred from any civil service job after an internal audit had noticed a large discrepancy between assets held in Jesse's name and his modest government salary. Jesse had earned around 15,000 pesos per month, and yet somehow he owned assets valued at over 9 million pesos. Also, he had multiple undeclared monthly incomes from gold mining commissions and a firearms business. As the net closed in around him, Jesse tried to sell off his assets and began high rolling it at the casinos to cover his mounting debts. As things deteriorated, Jesse's family requested that the Philippine Gambling Commission ban him from all casinos, a request which was granted in April 2017. Jesse was by now separated from his wife and the three children. Without a job or any steady income, he was banned from gambling and he was around 4 million pesos in debt. A debt which somebody wanted paying off and paying off sooner rather than later. At around 9 in the evening of June the 2nd 2017, Jesse attended a meeting at the Resorts World Manila Casino Complex where he met with 38-year-old lawyer Alma Mitra and 43-year-old Alvin Cruzin, a former police officer turned casino financier. Now, nobody knows for sure what that meeting was about, but it's entirely possible that Alma and Alvin were there to put pressure on Jesse to repay his debt. Whatever the reason for the meeting, it seems that Jesse wasn't too happy with what they had to tell him. Now, we'll never know for sure exactly what was discussed, as none of the three men at the meeting would live to see the next day. For Elmer and Alvin, they met their ends on the drive away from the casino. Sitting in the back seat of Elmer's grey BMW Series 3, Jesse pulled out a handgun and shot both men in the back of their heads as the car sped along the streets of Manila. 
The resulting car crash was caught on CCTV at 9.45pm and you can see Jesse getting out of the back of the upturned car and walking away without looking back. Now this is a man who's just crossed the Rubicon. There's no going back after this. Less than two hours later, Jesse hailed a taxi. Now, dressed all in black and carrying a backpack, his destination was again the Resorts World Manila Complex, but this time he wasn't going for a meeting. Arriving at just past midnight, Jesse rode the lift up to the casino and, having donned his black mask, made his way straight past the metal detectors, ignoring the frantic gesticulations of the security guard who was posted there. He unzipped his bag, pulled out his M4 Boschmaster semi-automatic rifle and began firing into the air. Panicked casino guests and employees ran for cover as Jesse purposefully walked through the complex, occasionally firing off a shot to clear the way ahead. At no time did he aim or shoot at anybody. All his shots were seemingly fired without the intention of hitting anyone. Arriving at the VIP lounges, Jesse pulled out a bottle of petrol from his bag and proceeded to douse and ignite the card tables. He then moved on to the VIP slot machines, shooting up the area and setting fire to the cushioned seats. Now it's impossible to tell what his intention was at this point. Maybe he wanted to create a distraction, or possibly he was just intent on destroying the casino in one last act of revenge. Nobody knows for sure what his motivation was, but this seemingly bizarre act of setting fire to the casino while he was still inside it would prove to have fatal consequences. A few minutes later, and apparently still in no great rush, Jesse arrived at the locked cash rooms and, just like in the movies, proceeded to gain entry to one by shooting out the lock and kicking in the door. Once inside, he found no cash, but instead millions in casino chips. Grabbing an estimated 112 million pesos worth of chips, which he then stuffed into his backpack, he left, heading for the stairs. By now, which was some 15 minutes after the start of the heist, the police SWAT teams were in the building. After surprising one officer in the stairwell, there was a brief firefight, although no one seemed to be hit. Jesse even returns briefly to close the stairwell door, again seemingly in no hurry. Heading up the stairs to the Maxims Hotel is the last footage that we see of him. According to police reports, he was subsequently injured, possibly sustaining a wound to the face. At around 1.45 in the morning, he's thought to have shot his way into room 510, he lit a fire in the corridor, and then barricaded himself in the room. At this point, he doused the bed in petrol, lay down on it, and set himself on fire before ending it all with a shot to the head. However, Jesse Javier Carlos was not the only victim that night. He'd left a box of bullets on one of the burning card tables, bullets which exploded in the heat, possibly leading frightened patrons who were hiding to believe that there was more than one gunman. 37 people, mostly women, afraid for their lives they'd hidden in a large pantry on the VIP casino floor. Hearing the sound of bullets firing and uncertain of what to do, they all stayed put, and all 37 tragically perished due to smoke inhalation. A further 70 people were injured in the crush to escape the burning building, some having leapt from windows to avoid being shot or to escape the spreading flames. In the immediate aftermath, the identity of the attacker wasn't known. His remains were burnt beyond recognition, and different accounts of who he was began to circulate. In one version, he's described as a tall, white foreigner who spoke English. In another version, he was a lone wolf gunman, possibly even an ISIS terrorist. Eventually, as the CCTV footage was repeatedly shown on TV, Jesse was recognised by his wife and parents and he was finally identified. The one thing in common that friends and family had to say was that no one expected this from Jesse. To all who knew him, it was unthinkable that he was this guy. The guy who set the casino on fire, the one who robbed the chip room, and the one who ended his life in room 510 of the Maxims Hotel. No one could believe it, and yet, there he was, rifle in hand, unmasked, 
on the stairwell CCTV. So, was he in reality just a cold, calculating killer who didn't care, who got hurt in his efforts to dig himself out of his debt trap? Or was he simply a flawed man staring at ruination, a man who was out of options, a man who just lost it at the end and decided to go out in one last all-or-nothing gamble? Whatever the truth, whether intentional or not, the actions of Jesse Carlos cost the lives of 37 innocent people that night. As Jesse's aunt said in an interview not long afterwards, they should have just killed him. He was running amok. If they had shot him, at least he would be the only one dead.